Amen. All right, over the last several weeks, we've been learning about prayer. Um, the Bible says that when we pray, so it doesn't mean if we pray, it means when we pray, um, that we're supposed to be praying with biblical hope, right? Um, biblical hope versus the hope that we, that, that we sometimes use in our English language, which is um, a hope filled with doubt. Um, like, I, you know, I hope it doesn't rain today, and I hope it doesn't rain next Sunday on our beach day. Um, but but biblical hope and faith and expectation. Many of you have been changing the way you pray. You've been texting us saying that I'm praying with expectation. When I pray, I'm expecting that God's listening. I'm expecting that God is answering, that's go- that he's going to answer, that he's hearing me. Um, we've learned that, that we tend to base our prayers and our expectations on our past experiences, and that's a problem because um, our past experiences, sometimes that it seems like God didn't answer, but we've been learning that, that God always answers, that sometimes he just doesn't answer the way that we think he's going to answer, right? And so, um, but that he always answers. We must learn to, to challenge. We've been, we've been saying that we've got to go and challenge those um, tendencies that we have to base today's prayers on our experiences in the past, right? That we've lowered our expectations. We don't want to get our hopes up because we've prayed that way before and it didn't come to pass. I don't want to get our hopes up. We want to challenge that and we want to say, God, you are still God. And and regardless of of what happened then, I'm going to trust that you had something better, that you knew better, that you are God, and that I am basing what I'm praying on right now, not on anything from the past, but on who you are. And on the fact that you are a good God and that I can come boldly. We'll talk about that today. I can come boldly before your throne. So we're, we're challenging that tendency to base anything on anything other than right here, right now, and who God is. And, and, and we're supposed to be hoping and believing and expecting and trusting God and understanding that he never disappoints. Because remember, disappointments are missed appointments. And that's where we get this feeling That somehow he missed an appointment. And what did we say last week? We said God never misses an appointment for anything, right? right. God never, ever misses an appointment for anything. Because how many of us, sometimes what we call a disappointment in reality is a divine appointment? Yeah. Come on, have you been there, anybody? A disappointment all of a sudden becomes a divine appointment. And can I tell you today that those divine appointments are better known as opportunities for us to grow because it stretches our faith. Amen? And then all of a sudden we get to know God in a greater way. Remember last week I told you how Joseph felt disappointed, but all of a sudden in reality it was a divine appointment because he went from the pit, the prison where ultimately to the palace. Amen? Make no mistake about it, there are divine appointments. And if we can rewind a couple of weeks ago, we ended the service, if you remember, with a couple of quotes and a promise, I told you, that we're going to come back and wrap up our prayer talks about discussing bold prayers. Mm -hmm. Today's going to be good. We left you with a couple of quotes. I want to share them with you. This is Mark Batterson, uh, author of The Circle Maker. If you've not read that book, go and buy it. It is an amazing book. Uh, Here's what Mark Batterson said. God isn't offended by your biggest dreams or boldest prayers. Mm -hmm. Come on. That is a slap in the face of reality. Come on, guys. God is not offended by your biggest dreams or boldest prayers. He is offended by anything less. If your prayers aren't impossible to you, they are insulting to God. Hmm. Bro, I don't know about you, but that was a wake-up call for me. Come on, guys. Yeah. And then we're going to look at um, Stephen Furtick. I know that many of you love him. If you're not daring to believe God for the impossible... You're sleeping through some of the best parts of your Christian life. Hmm. And further still, if the size of your vision of, for your life isn't intimidating to you, there's a good chance that it's insulting to God. Guys, that basically says this, that um, if we're not living a life that requires faith, then we're probably not showing up every day needing God to show up. We're probably showing up every day going, I got this. I got this, God. I, I, I don't need you. I don't need you to show up because I'm really not living a life beyond myself, beyond what I can handle. So God wants us to live a life that requires him to show up. So here's the question. Are we dreaming and praying that way? 
are we? Or, or have we lowered our expectations and our hopes because we're afraid to get hurt? Or because we are basing still our prayers and our hopes and, and our expectations on the past and we've lowered those things and, and we're not daring and we're not living impossible um, dreams and we're not living in, uh, and praying impossible prayers and we're not really living so that God has to intervene on our behalf. We're not laying on our faces before God, waking up every day going, God, I really need you to show up because I'm living beyond where I'm at. And some of you go, is that, is that even biblical? Am I supposed to live that way? Absolutely. We are designed to need God, right? So we're going to talk about that today. For most of us, we are not praying that way. We are not dreaming that way, and he wants us to. I am convicted already. <laughs> Come on, I'm being honest with you, man. There, there's been it's so many times already too. in my life and ministry that I have tried to do it all by myself. And I've been guilty because here's the key, guys. Watch this. When you try to do it by yourself, you take God out of the equation, and you become the answer. But instead of becoming the answer in reality, we become the problem because God is always the answer. Can you say amen? amen? So watch this. What kind of prayers are we praying? Think about that. What kind of prayers are we praying? Watch this. I fear that our prayers are often pointless and powerless. I'm about to preach. Get ready. I fear that our prayers are often pointless and powerless. And if I can, uh, if I can tell on myself for just a second, a lot of times if I'm not careful, I just pray to hear myself talk. Have you been there, anybody? If we're not careful, we use filler words. And, and some of us might be even more spiritual. And we know enough spiritual lingo to sound spiritual when we pray. Mm. I can see you. I just can't hear you this morning. <laughs> see, the problem is you and I, if we're not careful, we pray weak, wimpy prayers that might get as high as a ceiling before it crashes and falls down flat on the floor. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden we're left thinking, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? Maybe because we're taking God out of the equation. But in reality, what we need is we don't need a fear filled faith or fear filled uh, prayers that are tied with confusion, but instead we need faith-filled prayers tied with confidence, believing that what we pray for, God is a big enough God to meet our need. Can you say amen? amen. Guys, can I tell you today that we need to start believing God for big, bold, tenacious, and audacious prayers. Now's a good time to say amen. Because you didn't say it, let me repeat it one more time. We need to start believing God for big, bold, tenacious, and audacious prayers. Now watch this. The word audacious means daring and fearless. Because when we pray prayers like that, those are the ones that move the hand of God. Can I tell you today, Restore Church, it's time to pray bold prayers. Because bold prayers honor God and God honors God. Bold prayers. Can you say amen? Hmm. Almost every week we've put up a, a, a screen that says that we tend to get what we expect. So if we're not expecting anything, that might be why we're not getting anything. So we've got to stretch ourselves to get back to where we're expecting something again, right? And we have to expect something from God. We've already determined that most of us haven't been expecting much. I prayed with somebody last week that said, man, I... I I feel so convicted because I, I didn't even realize that I, I stopped expecting and hoping anything from God. I can't remember the last time that I assigned anything from God, that I expected much from God. It's been a long time. And when I pray, it's lip service. I literally just, while you were talking, I literally just pictured myself being like, have you ever, have you ever sat down with somebody and you go into glazing over because they're just talking about nothing. Anybody? Yeah. Sure, I'm not going to tell. Yes, I am. Anthony's got a word that when he's not listening, he goes, wow. It's a good word. Wow it's a safe a, word. Wow is a safe word. I'll tell you why wow is a safe word. Wow is a safe word. It's a much safer word than what he used to do. Wow is a safe word because if you say that your dog just got run over, wow is an okay word because wow means I'm so sorry. 
And if you just won the lottery, wow is a safe word because wow, that's awesome too. We were in a Walmart once and somebody had just said something really terrible and Anthony wasn't listening. It was like one o'clock in the morning and we didn't have any children and I think we were there to play football in the middle of an aisle. And some lady ran into us and she was telling us something really horrible and I could see the look on Anthony's face. He was totally glazed over. She'd been talking for about 35 minutes and she was saying something terrible and he says, wow, that's, no, he didn't say wow. He goes, that's great. And she goes, no, that's horrible. He goes, that's horrible. And so he changed completely to wow. And so now that wow is a good or a bad, but listen, if Anthony ever says wow to you, it doesn't mean he's not listening. It just means he could not be listening. Anyways, um, just kidding. It is a safe word. It is a safe word. You should try it. Anyways, but we've got to learn to expect again, right? And we're learning how to do that. Hopefully as you pray and as we're praying, you're, you're hearing that. You're hearing the fact that we should be paying attention to what we're saying to God so that we don't fall into that same thing where we're, I hate to say this, boring God with just talk. And he's glazed over because he knows that we're not really even paying attention to what we're saying. Yeah, and we're really not even expecting anything from him because he's heard it a million times. We're gonna to talk today about bold prayers, how to pray those bold prayers, how to pray specific prayers, and how to tune back into what we're praying, and, and, and how to pray bold again, so that not only is he listening, because he is listening, but that we're getting those answers that we're looking for. So let's remind ourselves what we've learned in the past weeks, and then move forward, what we can expect from God. We discovered that he wants us to expect big things, that he is waiting to bless us. We saw this in Isaiah, this is the last verse, that you will see that you said, I've already seen this before, but I want you to see that God wants us to expect from him. The Lord earnestly waits. He expects, he's looking, he's longing to be gracious to you guys. Get this in your spirit. And therefore he lifts himself up that he may have mercy on you, showing loving kindness to you for the Lord is a God of justice, blessed, happy, fortunate, To be envied are all those who earnestly wait for him, who expect and look and long for him, for his victory, for his favor, for his love, for his peace, for his joy, for his matchless, unbroken companionship. We talked about it a few weeks ago, how sometimes we walk through life just kicking the dirt, going, oh, I don't expect nothing from God. You know, I'm, I'm just glad he hadn't struck me down dead yet. I mean, some of us literally walk through life doing that. And this is very different. This is, this is a God who, who looks and longs to give me victory, to give me favor, to give me love and peace and joy and unbroken companionship. We should approach God in that way. He wants to have companionship with us. And so if we know that, it'll change the way we approach God. And if that's how we know he wants us to approach him, it's going to change the way we ask. If it changes the way we ask, it changes what we're asking for, and it's changing how we expect it to come. And it's going to probably change how we walk through our lives on a daily basis. Come on, that's good stuff, amen? What can we expect from God? We can expect two things. Number one, we can expect good things. What does the Bible say about that? Psalm 84, 11, here's what the word says. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. Watch this. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what? What is right. What is right? It's doing what God wants, not what you want. The second thing we can expect from God is everything working out for our good. Romans 8.28 says, For we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Guys, I'm excited about today, and uh, it's taken us a couple of weeks to get to this point uh, for for some stories that I'm going to tell. But for the next couple of quick moments, I want to bring three people to your attention. Three people who prayed big, bad, bold, powerful prayers. Now watch this. These were three mighty men of God who did not pray anemic prayers, but they prayed audacious prayers. They prayed with faith that their bold prayers will be answered by their big God. Can you say amen? There's three people that I want to bring to your attention. I want to talk 
to you this morning about Moses, about Joshua, and finally ending up with Elijah. And guys, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to go through these quickly, but these are powerful stories. And, and actually, when you read uh, Genesis or Exodus rather, chapter 32, uh, it, it is a powerful story, but kind of funny at the same time. Now, here's what happened. Exodus chapter 32, the Bible says that God called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai. Moses was away from the children of Israel for 40 days. He was praying, he was fasting, and it was there on top of the mountain when he was spending communion one-on-one time with God Almighty that the Lord began to instruct Moses about the Ten Commandments that we still have and that we still live by today. Can you say amen? But guys, here's the point I want to make. Within this 40-day time period when Moses was away, all of a sudden, the children of Israel had forgotten what God had done in their lives. Can I tell you, it took 40 days for them to forget about a divine deliverance when they were spending a 400-year prison sentence in the land of Egypt. All it took was 40 days. So as they began to grumble and complain and, and asked Aaron, Moses' brother, said, where is your brother? He's forgotten about us. We don't know where he is. So they looked at Aaron, the second man in charge, and said, we've got to have something, not someone, but something to pray to. Aaron looked at the people and said, why don't you give me all your gold? Now watch this. The Bible says that he told the women, the daughters, and the sons to give them their earrings. So did men have earrings in the Bible? Yes, they did. It's in Genesis 32. Just saying. So if you go and you have an earring next week, I know that you obeyed the Bible. Come on, guys. <laughs> now watch this. The, the Bible says that Aaron took all the gold and then he threw it in the fire and then he began to mold it and make it. And what he made was a, some, the Bible says a young calf, but the original translation actually said it was a golden bull, which was a sign of strength and power. So they were looking to a false god instead of the faithful god. So here's what happened. They began to pray and to worship this golden image the next day. But little did they know that up on the mountain, God had a conversation with Moses and told them that he better get down and take care of business. Now here's here's, here's a key I want to make. Watch this. Here's how powerful this prayer was. God was sick and tired of Israel forgetting about how good he had been to them. So the Bible says God was so angry that he was about to wipe them off the face of the earth. Now here's the bold prayer that, watch this, that Moses, the man of God, did. He stood before an angry God, or in between, rather, an angry God and a backslid bunch of people. And he boldly, watch this, he boldly prayed and petitioned to God Almighty that God would remember the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he would not destroy this backslid bunch of people. Did you catch that? He boldly prayed and believed that God would obey his command and that God would obey the covenant and God would save the children of Israel. If it were not for Moses, they would have been wiped off the face of the earth. That is a bold prayer to stand between an angry God and a bunch of backslidden people. Can you say amen? Now, i got to tell you the rest of the story, which I find comical. When, when Moses uh, came down from the top of the mountain and rebuked everybody for their unbelief and, and uh, worshiping a pagan image... He took that golden calf and he melted it down and then he ground it up and put it in water. And everybody that worshiped, he made them drink it to give them a taste of their own medicine. Can you say amen? Come on, Moses was a bad joker. Can I get a witness, somebody? Then I love the response because he looked at Aaron, his brother, the very spokesperson that spoke to Pharaoh when Moses delivered the people. He looked at Aaron and said, Man, what are you doing? What are you thinking? You know what Aaron's response was? Guys, how many of you, when you're put on the spot, the first thing you do is lie? Don't raise your, you know, you can keep your hands down because you're lying right now. (laughs) If you've never done that and you didn't raise your hand, you're lying now. Come on. (laughs) Moses looked at Aaron and said, what are you thinking? You know what Aaron said? He lied through his teeth. Aaron said, well, I don't know what happened. I took all their gold and I threw it in the fire and out jumped a calf. 
Well, so the Bible says, hey, it's a crazy book. Read it. Chapter 32 is amazing, but guys, here's the key. Moses prayed a bold prayer. He stood between an angry God and and, and people, and he prayed a bold prayer, believing God, and they were divinely delivered one more time. Can you say amen? Amen. The second person I'll bring to your attention is Joshua. Uh, You can put that screen up there. We're going to go to that in just a second. The Bible says in the book of Joshua, chapter 10, that there were seven kings that were coming against Joshua. Not only seven kings, but seven kings and their entire army. They were coming against Joshua to fight him and try to destroy the entire inhabitants of the land of Israel. But here's the cool part. God told Joshua in the very beginning, don't worry, I've already given you the victory. Man, can I tell you when God says that, you can bank on it because one more time, God is not a man that he should lie. And if he said it, then that settles it. Amen? So here's what happened. Joshua went into the battle. There were seven kings and seven armies that were going against Joshua and the mighty men of Israel. And I love what happened. As Joshua looked at them, he said, you know what? I'm about to run out of day. So God, would you please, watch this. He prayed with boldness. He was specific in his prayers. Watch this. He prayed with faith unwavering. This mighty man of God stood between the entire uh, country of Israel. He looked up into heaven. And this is what he did. He said, he began to pray and he said, God, would you allow the sun to stand still over Gibeon and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon? Let's go, on to the, let's go to the next screen. Watch this. So the sun stood still. Are you hearing me today? He prayed. Now, does that mean, now, we know that, that the earth revolves around the sun. So what does that mean? Does that mean that, that everything stopped? No, it means that God supernaturally calls the sun to stay in the sky a lot longer than it was normally done. Amen. Watch this. The Bible says, so the sun stood still. The moon stopped. Are you hearing me today? Till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. Now here's the cool part. The Bible says, as it is written in the book of Jasher, that is another book that is a companion piece to the Bible, it is a historical document that, that proves the Bible is real. Can you say amen? So this was written in a historical book. The Bible says, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Guys, I want you to grasp this. Here was Joshua, one of the 12 spies that were chosen by Moses to go and spy out the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report. The other 10 people said, we can't do it. They're too big. They're too strong. They're too fast. But Joshua and Caleb operated in the spirit of faith instead of the spirit of fear. Are you hearing me? Now, here's the cool part. Joshua and Caleb, you continue to read about in the Bible. But the other 10 people who were negative every time they opened their mouth, you never heard about them again. That's for somebody this morning. Watch this. Joshua stood in the presence of the entire country of Israel and in the presence of God Almighty. He prayed a big, bad, bold, audacious, tenacious prayer because he knew According to the book of Genesis, that God hung the planets in the sky, that God was in charge of the sun, the moon, and every single planet in our solar system. So if God made it, then God can stop it from moving. Can you say amen? So in reality, I believe that Joshua said, God, would you extend the light so we can fight with all our might? And guess what happened? The sun stood still, and the moon stayed, and God gave them the victory. Can you say amen? Now let's quickly look at the last person, Elijah. I love this man. He is a mighty prophet. Let me, let me tell you the, 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 the back story real quickly. One more time, Israel as a nation was backslid. They were praying to pagan deities instead of God Almighty. The Bible says they were on top of the mountain, Mount Carmel and other mountains surrounding Israel, actually making sacrifices and killing people, and offering sacrifices such as animals to a pagan god by the name of Baal. So God raised up a mighty prophet by the name of Elijah. And according to 1 Kings 17 and 18, he walked up to King Ahab, who was married, by the way, to a witch. So the Bible says, Israel was so backslidden, the king did not believe in God. His wife was a witch. 
bad situation. Can you say amen? So all of a sudden, Elijah, the man of God, walks up to the very throne where the king was sitting at, looked him in the eyes, and he said, you will not see my face again till God sends rain on the earth. Then he turned around, spun on his heels, and walked off, never to be seen of again, for three and a half years. Guys, can I tell you this morning that we serve a big God that can answer bold prayers, that can stop the sun in his tracks, that can cause the rain not to, to replenish the earth, that can cause a drought to get God's attention or to get other people's attention? Amen? That's the kind of God we serve when you and I pray and believe that he can answer bold prayers. For three and a half years, there was not one drop of rain. God sent a drought to get their attention. But the same man that prayed a bold prayer that the heavens would be stopped up was the same man three and a half years later that came back around and prayed another bold, big, tenacious, come on somebody, audacious prayer. And it was God Almighty who began to open up the heavens and the earth to restore and replenish the, rain, the land by sending a latter day rain. Can you say amen, somebody? One more time, guys. Bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. So let me ask you a question. How in the world are we supposed to approach his throne and pray? How do we do that? Well, the Bible says to come boldly before the throne. But can I be honest with you? We, we don't boldly go. We barely go. Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. The issue is we don't boldly go. We barely go before his throne. And when we do go... I venture to say that we go in fear that our prayer will not be answered instead of going in faith knowing that we serve a big God that answers bold prayers. Come on, you can say amen if you want to. Hebrews 4.16 says this, Let us therefore come, what? Boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. How do we approach his throne and pray? Number two, we come as a natural human. Watch this. With a clean heart, seeking a supernatural God. Guys, I've learned in ministry that if I do the natural, he'll do the supernatural. I can't do the supernatural. Amen? If I do the ordinary, God will do the extraordinary. That's not my job, but it is his. Can you say Amen? Watch this, James 5, 16 and 17. Don't miss this. The Bible says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The Bible says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. How amazing is that? The Bible says Elijah was human. Did you hear that? Now, let's, let's be honest. I guarantee that when I begin to share the stories about these mighty men of God, these, these powerful prophets that, that prayed and the, and the sun stood in the sky for an extra 24 hours, or that the heavens uh, stopped producing rain for three and a half years, or that a man stood between an angry God and they, their lives were spared, some of you thought to yourself, well, of course, they were prophets. That's why God answered their prayer. Well, of course that happened because they were mighty men of God. Listen, don't buy into that, because here's what the Bible says. Elijah was as human as we are. Did you catch that? He's no respecter of persons. Elijah was as human as we are. Watch this. And yet when he prayed earnestly, in other words, with sincere and intense conviction. Wow. There's the difference. That no rain would fall. The Bible says none fell for three and a half years. Here's the key. Elijah, Moses, and Joshua prayed with excitement, and they prayed with expectation. Remember this. Expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. All right. So if you, if you, uh... if, if you tuned out, we need you to tune back in. 
because there's only five of these, and we're on two, and we're done. You're like, really? I'm listening. <laughs> How are we to approach the throne? Boldly? We got that. Come as a natural human, pastor said, come as you are. That they were normal, average, everyday human beings. That's awesome for you and me. However, go back to two, please. Don't miss the with a clean heart part. Come on. And you're going, I knew there was a catch. Oh, there's a catch. See, here's the deal, guys. <laughs> We can't expect to approach a holy God with a dirty heart, with wrong motives. Some of us can't figure out, you're going, so you're telling me I could pray a bold prayer, and then we come in here all miffed, or maybe don't come back at all, because we prayed a prayer and God didn't answer. But yet at the same time, there's no sacrifice before the altar. There's no urgency in our prayer. And, and here's the thing, that earnest prayer of a righteous person, the great power and the wonderful reserve, results come from the earnest prayer of a righteous person. There's, there is no accident that those two Verses are coupled together. If you look at them, they almost look like they don't belong together. It almost looks like the Elijah was a was as human as we are. Is just like a is that a is that a is that should an asterisk be there? Is that pastor's notes? No, that's in the verse. That's in the Bible. They look like they don't belong together. Confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Earnest prayer of a righteous person ha brings great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was a human as we are. Wait, what? What, where, what? It's in there because Elijah was human. But he checked his heart. He was a righteous person. And that's what brought the power and the results. And that's where we get the A, right to approach his throne. And B, that's where the power and the results come from. Because we approach the throne understanding that we have come before God and we have made sure that we have checked our heart before we go to God with this bold prayer. And we have made sure that there is no unrighteous sin in our lives. And we've made sure that there's no obstacles getting in between our prayer and our God. See, there are obstacles to our prayers. And some of us are going, see, man, that's the catch. Well, it, it's not really a catch. It's a requirement. God made a way out. God made a way for us to be forgiven of this sin. The Bible says that, that he is, that, that if we forgive, that he'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we bring it to him. So when we're approaching his throne, if we're not getting those answers, stop Check our heart, go back and say, is there any unrighteousness in my life? Am I maybe not getting the answers because there's something God's requiring of me and I'm not doing my part? Maybe, maybe God's not the problem. Maybe, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm coming before God and, and I'm not coming before him as a righteous person. Maybe I'm not praying an earnest prayer Maybe I'm really not seeking God. Maybe I'm just looking for him to do something for me, and I've really not checked myself at all. So here's what I want to ask you. Make sure, have you identified, are there any obstacles to your prayers or anything that is stopping your prayer from getting through? Is there any unforgiveness in your heart? Is there any wrong motive for which you're praying? Are there any secret sins that we're harboring? That unrighteousness will stop our prayers from getting in every single time. For some of you, you're going, oh my goodness, I got it. I know exactly why I'm not being heard. 
if we could stop and identify that. Now, an earnest prayer. See, that earnest prayer, we got to get to that place where I can tell you that um, Moses, Moses just came down from the mountain spending 40 days fasting and praying with God. He wasn't just a guy that woke up one day, loved one prayer in, and that was bold, and God answered. That earnest prayer came from a dude that was seeking God on his face, praying and fasting. Joshua was one that was seeking God. They were all seeking God. They were all going after him. You see, and I know he probably doesn't want me pointing this out, but there's a reason why Kirk is half a man today. See, he's at a place where he's fasting on something. And he's not walking around telling everybody, I need an answer to prayer and I'm fasting. But he's been doing it for weeks now. He just didn't tell anybody because we're not supposed to tell anybody. And he didn't tell anybody. I told on him. He's not dying. I just need you to know that. In fact, he's finally gotten to a place where he says, God, I need you to hear me. I've been lobbing up the same prayer for a long time, but I'm finally serious. I need you to hear me. And I'm not waiting for January for my pastors to call me a fast. I'm calling my own fast. I need you to hear me. And you know what's so great is that is the earnest prayer of a person that while he's praying, he is becoming righteous because guess what? It's that place where he's saying, I, look, I don't, even, I don't even care right now what the outcome of all of this is. I'm getting myself right through this thing. That's the righteous prayer part. That's the righteous person part. And the earnest prayer is the God, I am coming before you. I need an answer. And I am going to hear from you. And I know you're hearing from me. And that's what's going to bring the wonderful results. And that's what's going to bring the great power. You see, we can come as a natural human being. But you got to get to that place where you come with a clean heart. And you know that he's a supernatural God. But you got to get to that place where you say, I'm bringing this bold prayer. Because I need an answer. Sir, see, some of us think that we're just going to wake up, lob up a bold prayer, and God's going to bring a bold answer, and we could just do whatever. Bold prayers get answered from an awesome God because we've gotten to that place where we have become um, desperate to be heard. Desperate to be heard. Point number three, guys, watch this. Come with confidence, asking according to his will, knowing that he hears us. Watch this. 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Here's the key. Watch this. We must pray according to God's will, not our will. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes my prayers seem to be selfish. Hmm. My will's always selfish. Come on, guys. You can say amen. amen. My will's always selfish, but what happens is when I begin to pray his will, my prayer changes. It becomes not selfish, but selfless. See, we're not praying in an effort to change God's mind. We're praying in an effort to change our hearts. Come on. Can you say amen? amen. That's good. Number four, ask and ask boldly. For big, specific things. That's good. James 4, 2, one of my favorite verses. You have not because you ask not. Hmm. Man, that's one of the first scriptures I ever learned. Can you say amen? That's good. <laughs> so why don't we ask? Maybe because we don't ask out of ignorance of knowing that we can ask God for what we need. Now we know. That's right. Now we know. Sometimes we don't ask out of guilt. Right? So then we got to figure out, is this, um, is this false guilt? Is it the kick in the dirt? Oh, I don't, I don't deserve anything good. And, and um, you know, the, it, that false guilt that says, you know, oh, woe is me. I, I don't deserve anything good. I, I don't deserve to go before his throne. I, I, I don't. 
that's false guilt. We've got to be careful about that false guilt. We're going to get to that. That's our last point. We're going to get to that in just a second. Watch out for false guilt. He wants us to come to him. He's our heavenly father. Or is it that true guilt that we just talked about? Because if it's the true guilt and we're not coming to him it, because we know instinctively that we've got something in there that we need to take care of, that's simple. Take care of it, right? What did we just say? that he is a good father, that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So sometimes guilt keeps us from asking, you have not because you ask not. Well, I'm not asking because I feel guilty. Well, then take care of it. Clean up your life. It's simple. You got a heavenly father. You got access. Why keep something in your life that keeps you from being able to go to him and ask? Take care of it. And if you got false guilt, let's take care of that. We will today. Absolutely. Anybody getting what we're saying today? Yeah. Here's another, here's another reason why we don't ask. Maybe because of pride. Mm. Come on, we're self-made men. We did this all by ourselves. So we don't need any help. We got this. No, you don't. We have got to have God's help. Can you say amen? amen. The second thing, maybe it's the fear of looking stupid. Which is pretty much pride too, Right. right? Man, I don't know about you, but sometimes in my Christian walk, I've been scared to share my request with other people for what I'm believing God for because in the back of my mind, fear is there. And it says, but what if it doesn't happen and you look dumb? Mm. Wow, have you been there, anybody? How many of you hedge before you say something like, I'm praying for this, but, you know, I just, you know, I, I mean, if it doesn't happen, I mean, it's, it's cool. And how many of you hedge? You do that? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm really believing for this, but, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, what? why do we do that? Because we're afraid to look stupid if it doesn't come to pass, right? I mean, sometimes it's about that. Sometimes, legitimately, it is. Sometimes it's a what if it doesn't come to pass. And sometimes it's a, well, even if it doesn't come to pass, it's okay. Because I still trust and I still believe in my God. Right, right. He's sovereign and he knows what's best for me. And if that, that dream that I'm, that I'm looking forward to doesn't come to pass or it comes to pass differently than how I'm seeing it, then I trust God. That's right. So you have to discern, am I hedging because I'm not sure or because I don't really have faith? Or am I hedging because I, I really truly trust God either way? Right. But either way, do it boldly. Amen. Do it boldly. Don't hedge because you don't know. Don't hedge. If God's shown you something, then say it with everything that's inside of you. Absolutely. Say it. If you're going to ask, ask boldly. And don't worry about looking stupid. Come on. Don't worry about looking stupid. That's pride. It's all about God. It's for his glory. It's for his honor. I can't tell you how many people we've prayed for at altars. Some of them have gotten healed. Some of them have dropped their crutches and picked them up in their hand and walked out of the back door. Others we've prayed for, they didn't get healed. They walked off on the same crutches. It didn't keep us from praying for the next guy with crutches. Right. The enemy tried to make it so. The next time I went to lay hands on that person, the last guy you prayed for didn't walk out with them in their hand. You have to rebuke that, silence that, shut that up. It's not based on past experience. It's based on the God that I'm praying to. Amen? Amen. I don't know why God does what he does, why he does one and he doesn't the other. I don't know where their faith is. I don't know if it has to do with them or if it has to do with me or if it has to do with the I don't know, but this is what I know. And so we continue to pray to a God who does not change. His answers change in this moment. I don't know all the answers, but I do know that he is faithful regardless of what I'm seeing with my natural eye. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we don't ask because we're afraid of the answer. We're afraid that he's going to open a door that we don't really want to go through. We're going to have to do some work we don't want to do. We're afraid he's going to shut a door that we really, really, really want to go through. So we don't pray because we don't really want to know. Hmm. But what does the Bible instruct us to do? Out of the message version in James 1, 6 through 8, the Bible says, Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. Watch this. People who worry their prayers, not pray their prayers, worry their prayers. How many of you worry your prayer instead of actually pray your prayer? 
We're not actually praying it. You just sit there and you're just having a conversation in your head and you're just worrying your prayer mm. instead of praying your prayer. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, just want to explain that. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Listen, hmm. this is James, by the way, Jesus' little brother. He knew what he was talking about. He said, don't worry or don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Other versions say that they're a double-minded man, praying one thing but believing another. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. They said they're adrift at sea, keeping all their options open. I love what the Living Bible said. It says, if you don't ask with faith, don't expect the Lord to give you any solid answer. Yikes. Wow. Yep. Come on, that's good. Yep. If you won't say amen, I will. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Guys, let me share something with you real quick. Let's go back to Joshua quickly, and let me share something with you. Stop being intimidated about asking God to do big, bold things in your life. Stop being intimidated to pray for miracles because God is a miracle worker. Can you say amen? amen. Mm -hmm. Guys, let me read something to you. I found this yesterday, and it talked about Joshua asked God to do a mighty miracle by asking that the sun would stand still. That, in other words, the, the day would supernaturally be straight or lengthened so that they could destroy their enemies. Watch this. We need to stop being afraid to ask, and we need to stop being afraid to pray for miracles. Yeah. Listen to this. It's up to the Lord to grant them, but it's up to you and I to ask him. Come on, that's good. God doesn't need our prayers in order to provide, but he often invites us into the process. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. When God answers our prayers, it builds our faith. So let me challenge you this morning. Pray big, bold, tenacious, and audacious prayers and watch God strengthen your faith today. Guys, we had in that um, number four big specific things. And there's a reason why we say pray big specific things. Here's why. Because if you're not praying specifically, you're probably not thinking about what you're praying about. You're probably just going, God, just bless me. They're like big blanket prayers. You're just not, you're just really not thinking about them. You're just going, Lord, bless me. And you're just, you're not thinking about it. When you sit down and you get specific with God, first of all, you're bringing him your desires. And you really only get specific with your desires with someone you're in relationship with. Think about that. That's good. Think about that. And he's all about relationship, right? You really only get specific and detailed and really give your heart open to someone you have relationship with. So he's after relationship. Also, when you put out your desires to somebody, you hear what you desire, and you also go, oh, yeah, that sounded really bad. That's probably not the right motive, is it? When you say it out loud, you go, oh, yeah. And you identify desires that are really not of God. That's another reason to pray specific prayer. Here's another reason to pray specific prayer. Because specific prayers means that you're also looking for a specific answer. Mm, okay. And man, does it show off God when he specifically answers. Right. He's not going to like me doing it, but if you're in my family, you normally get told on. I will never forget. My brother had been praying for a wife. Specifically. I'm, tell I'm telling you that my brother had been praying for a wife, and he... He was at the age that he'd really been praying for a wife. I want to say something so bad right there. Yeah, he does. <laughs> and you know, you're, you're at an age once where you're going, I'm, pray I'm praying for a wife. And then you get to the age where you're like, I'm really praying for a wife. And you get to that place where you're really praying for a wife and you start getting specific. And see, he's always called us his pastor. And we're so thankful for that. And so we would minister to him. And I remember when he told us that he had a, a list of exactly what he was praying for. And he was very specific. And as his pastor, I should be this very, this one that would look at him and say, that's a great list. And I have all the faith in the world that God's going to give you exactly that. But as his pastor, I was a little scared for him. 
because it was so detailed that I thought, I'm not sure that God can deliver this order. I mean, it was, it was specific, very specific. But he knew what he wanted, and he had waited. And he had given the desires to God, and he had said, God, I've waited this long, and this is what I'm believing for, and I have done this right. I, have, I, I, I am an eligible bachelor, and yet at the same time, I have not done this the wrong way. I'm waiting for the one you would want to give me. And so as a result of that, I've done the right thing. And so therefore, I have the right to ask what I want. And he was specific. And boy, can I just tell you that when he met her, it was a glaring everything right down to the color of the hair. Can I tell you that on the list, there was, and correct me if I'm wrong, but on the list, there were a couple things that I thought. A Southern girl that would wear, that would wear pearls, right? In, in her, what's that? In her ears, in Eyes, hands, height. Specific. Come on, guys. Right. That she would, um, horses on the beach. Wasn't that on there somewhere? Yeah, that's a good one. (laughs) Right down. I mean, hand, everything. I'm like, hands. Come on. Does that need to be on the list? Because he's a hand man. And right down to everything. Hair, everything. And when he met her, it was like glaringly obvious. And let me, can I tell the good part? Can I tell the age? Can I tell that? I can tell that, right? That's not bad, right? That's good. That's a good thing. I think all the men would say amen to that. So let me tell you how good God is. Let me tell you how good God is. When he met her, he had come down from Chicago, and he partnered with a gentleman, and they bought a building down on Center Street in uh, Amelia, right? And they owned the whole building, but they worked on the entire third floor. And every morning he would go into the coffee shop, the Seattle's best coffee shop downtown, or, you know, down and get a cup of coffee to go in his building, cup of coffee to go up to the third floor. They own the whole building to go up there to get um, his coffee to go up to work. And Shannon worked in the coffee shop and served him the coffee every day. Not a coincidence. Not a coincidence, but hang on. And here's the thing. He wouldn't date around because he said, I don't want to waste their time or my time. I don't want to miss who God has for me. I'm an eligible bachelor, but I don't want, he didn't say this. I said this and he wouldn't date around. He said, I don't want to miss it. And I don't want to cause anybody else to miss it. So we did it the right way. But here's the thing. When I knew what he was praying for, I used to say to him, he said, God's going to bring her to me. And I would say, but Todd, you got to start giving out your address, dude. I mean, she's got to know where to find you. And so the coolest thing, I'm like, here's the faithful pastor, right? And here's the thing. God did bring her to his door, almost literally, because he bought the building and the chick's in the building. Do you know what I'm saying? But here's the coolest part. Here's the coolest part. He came to us and he said, I need y'all to pray for me because I found the one she meets, she meets the list like perfectly. She's the one I'm telling you. And I said, so what's the problem? He said, you got to pray for me because I'm telling you people are going to really look cross-eyed at this thing. I said, why? He said, she's 15 years younger than me. And of course, Anthony said, what's wrong with that, dude? <laughs> he said, God is good, Right? <laughs> No, he didn't mean that in a bad way. She was head over heels for him, too, and didn't know how old he was. And she, he didn't know how old she was. But when they found out, it was already too late because they were already falling in love with each other. Does that make sense? And let me preface, I'm okay with that as long as it's not my daughter. Right, 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 okay. right. Okay. Right. 
so the work had already been done and, and then they figured out that oh my goodness like this has already been done we've our eyes have already met you know it's 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 already done and so God is so good and can I just tell you, you've seen them floating around the church. It's Todd and Shannon, and they've got Brooke and Logan, and they're just amazing. And Emmeline, Emmeline, just, well, she's just a little tiny thing. She's in the nursery, I guess. And it's just amazing. But here's the thing. He did it right. He made that list. He was bold with it, and he was specific. And when she walked up on the scene, it was like there was a, a beam that came from heaven with the angels. Oh, you know what I'm saying? I mean, when you pray specific prayer, it, it tells on God. You see, and some of us are afraid to pray that way. It's, and, and, and here's the thing. He may have not started that way, but when he got to the place where he was like, all right, God, I'm not messing around anymore. This is exactly what I want. And sometimes we just got to get to that place. Last point. Ready? Here we go. Let's wrap this up. Come and ask as a beloved child of God. And here's where some of us are missing this. Here's, it. here's where it's at. How do you approach the throne? You come as a beloved child of God. Romans 8, 15 through 17 says this. And so we should not be like cringing, fearful slaves but we should behave like God's very own children adopted into the bosom of his family and calling to him, Father, Father. For his Holy Spirit speaks to us deep within our hearts, telling us we are really his children. Since we are his children, we will share in his treasures for all of God's, uh, for all God gives to his son Jesus is now ours too. I want you to hear me. The reason why some of us don't, don't pray bold prayers is simply this. We don't have a proper understanding of our relationship with the Father. Therefore, we don't have proper understanding of our access to Him. See, relationship determines the access. And until we understand the relationship that we have, you won't utilize your access. You see, some of you have a relationship with your God that says, he is my daddy. And you go running to him. And you pray bold prayers because you know that he's your daddy and he hears you and you have full access and it doesn't matter what time of day or night and you run up into his arms and you talk to him like he's your daddy. Others of you, you come like a cringing, fearful slave and you don't believe you have access and you don't believe that he wants to even see your presence. And you're not sure if he even likes you. And therefore you don't utilize your access. You don't come boldly. You don't come confidently. You don't come in any of the ways that we talked about today. Because you're not sure. And you're fearful. And even though 1 John 4.18 says that, that perfect love drives out and casts out fear. You come with fear because you don't know his perfect love just yet. That scripture says, you come as father. Guys, none of this sermon even matters if you don't get the relationship part right. Because you'll never take your access.